Hello and warm welcome everyone to Analyst by Vaji Raman Ravi. Today we are going to comprehensively discuss seven articles under two sections. These articles have been taken from the Indian Express and the Hindu. Section A wherein we will analyze two articles in depth. First of them is about the social media and its impact on youth and what can be done about it. Second article is on the India-Bhutan relationship, significance of the relations, various challenges and the way ahead to further improve them. Next in the section B, that is the simplified section, we will take five another articles along with the value addition part. This is going to help you in your upcoming prelims. So stay tuned. So starting with the first article of the day, which is about the impact of social media and the context is in recent months, we have seen Australian government passing such a law to limit the use of social media for young children and youth. Similarly, today we have been reading in the newspapers that Spain has been making similar legislations and laws. And we can also see coming this kind of legislation from France, from some corners of the US. So let's see what is the need to regulate social media, especially for youth and the young children. First of all, let's say not to forget that there are numerous positive benefits and impact of social media. So just to start with, that it gives voice to marginalized and to overall population across the world, and especially to the marginalized. For example, that could be from LGBTQ community or the other marginalized sections that are not really represented in general media. And so they could be one of the positive examples. Second, it could be gateway to talent. How? For example, let's say there could be videographers or it could be useful in taking videography or photography. So many talents have been coming up by posting all of these their talents and their creative works online and all of these platforms, they are gaining recognition. They are making successful careers out of it. That is something productive also and they are earning their livelihoods as well. Second, it could be about digital activism. Uh, the third aspect is digital activism and the social change. So for example, there was this voice of Greta Thunberg. You must have heard this name. This was related to uh, consciousness and the recognition of environmental uh, conservation. But this became the news of the world when it got highlighted on these social media platforms. So that is just one example. You can also relate to other examples as well. Fourth point here is about the research. Let's say some research is going on and active participation of the participants or the host or probably different networks and connecting to different uh, constituents and compositions of the network is possible by connecting via social media platform. That becomes easy. The group from where the tests have to be conducted or the exper uh, experiment has to be conducted, that becomes a wide based. So that gives more credibility and authority to such a research. Then it could also be about identity formation. So we all know that these formative years for anyone, for any children are very important. These are the initial years, which are like blank pages. Whatever information, identity, or whatever the leanings that they have in these years left a deep mark or entrenched mark for their entire lives. So it is very important that these kids or the youth get the right kind of information, the accurate and the credible information that makes them informed citizens or infor informed human beings to take rational decisions in future. So it, ha it could have, social media could rightly have the required impact on their identity. Connection. Again, it's, uh, during COVID-19, we saw that many people, when they were isolated in their homes, when uh, the quarantine uh, season was going on, when there was lockdown, sessions of lockdown going across the world in many countries, there was one way of connection, mainly maintaining contacts between people, knowing different kinds of world or their lives. That was one, social media. So it had played a crucial role during those times and uh, have been able to maintain and stay in touch with your near and dear ones. So that is one of the examples. Then it could also be a source of positive inspiration. The real role models, the real life heroes could be your inspiration and role models from whom you can learn a lot. That could be any field, but rightly chosen models can guide you across your life if you have taken right lessons from right people. So these are some of the positive aspect and impact of using social media. But there is a caveat. 
if to use these uh, advantages or probably to make use of these uh, advantages given by the social media one has to be informed one has to be aware of the issues and the challenges that social media brings with it there are negatives attached also like any other technology or the technological platform social media has its own share of demerits as well so let's just uh, dive deep in some of those negative aspects first of all if let's say it leads to generation or addiction or if you are using any social media platform out of its uh, time range or unnecessarily or beyond a time limit it could lead to generation of an addiction and this in some uh, social and newspaper corners they have also equated it with a uh, with a addiction similar to a cigarette addiction so that is just to say some studies have been conducted and they have been found that it leaves the same kind of impact on human and especially on youth brains that's why the discussion on this article so it could lead to mental health problems it could lead to anxiety it could lead to stress and that could affect life in many ways second physical health problems could also result if your life becomes stable if you do not take to real life activities or outdoor activities if you do not establish real connections then physical health problems and many diseases could follow again like i said it's very important to have healthy social relations be it with your peers be it with your friends or even to your family members if we are already stuck or already glued to our screens we'll have no real connections we would not know how it is to be on ground and always there is a stark difference between any activity going on behind the screen on the screen and on ground so social relations also suffer the fourth point that i would like to mention here is about technology addiction this technology like any other uh, technology is bound or probably prone to get uh, give you addiction or any youth especially the minds that are generating or generating norms or establishing those uh, in their initial years they are tend to get addicted with these ad adoption of technology if not proper rules proper accountability proper supervision is not there so they become addiction then there are instances of cyber bullying or also trolling on the social media platform and any age group could suffer from it but particularly minds youth minds can get uh, situations where they could take to harmful and the worst uh, resorts for example some uh, students or some of these youth have been taken to taken the route the route of suicide also in the worst cases and also the host who are actually uh, on the side of committing or probably practicing cyber bullying most in most of the cases they are found to be suffering from uh, delinquent behavior uh, then aggression or anxiety and their own depressions but then both sides of are affected by it but we need to get down to the root of it and probably regulate the usage of this media and make these both of these parties aware of the consequences of it then reinforcing prejudices so social media is a corner where it operates on the logic of logarithm if you operate any or if you follow any page then uh, there is a tendency on the social media that you would tend to see similar kind of pages so it creates a boundary it creates a perception illusion around you and gives you retreats and reforms what you already believe in that might need uh, cross checking but if you are surrounded on social media with a similar kind of opinions then there is a less uh, tendency to get you through the refined view where you need to sit down and see both sides of any issue the positive the negatives and then take your informed decision so like i said it if it is reinforcing your prejudices it is not educating you it is not helping you in your knowledge building it is probably restricting your world view then privacy worries there is also the case and allegations of data localization uh then when these platforms and social media platforms do not give in to the rules and regulation of the host country they do not agree to the data localization they probably import and export this kind of data without the consent there are also privacy issues so all of these negatives are there having said that let's see how social media can affect your mental health like i've said there are mental health problems for example it could lower somebody's self esteem 
if you're constantly in a cycle of comparing with those people who you already who are who you are not aware with who whose situations and circumstances you are not fully aware uh, aware about but you're still comparing your grounds with them it sends a wrong signal to your mind and probably you start to feel low or your self esteem suffers it's very important to understand that it's uh, there is no end to this comparison culture and that's why it's not healthy instead the time that you have wasted in comparison and probably browsing through those social media platforms and feeds you may invest that kind of time in building your skills and probably working in those areas where you think you lack and that could be the only and the one solution towards probably overcoming that so one thing second thing it could also lead to problem control impulsions generally people uh, depending on the social media platform even just for entertainment after some time have been seen to witness impulsive kind of reactions and their short span and their focus attention gets reduced and that they are not able to focus on any productive or even any activity for a longer time that is again uh, weakens your capability then these uh, users also take to unhealthy coping mechanism in in fact it it also showcases symptoms of depression anxiety and uh, in worst cases some delinquent behaviors and if nothing to add just the worst case of suicides also have been found to be the uh, resorts after suffering through depression that comes to using and irrationally using the social media platforms so that is like you can in in concisely you can understand what social media leads to if we look on to the negative aspect of it it could lead to cyberbullying like i've already said i'm just comprehending and summarizing it for you it could lead to lack of privacy it could again lead to anxiety depression and sets unrealistic expectation you have to understand it both sides uh, the on real or on real or uh, probably on life it's the human being any human being cannot do what is humanly possible in any life if somebody is in the real you have to understand that's a real that could have a lot of modifications and editings it is not really how things are in actual life and you should probably try to keep yourself in the shoes of that person and then have the expectations in uh, which is consonant in which is in consonant to the reality then there could be false connection you may think that you have a larger list of friends but when you realize that those connections are how credible those connections are you should be raising these kind of questions to yourself and you will have your own answer then yes if you are taking to browsing through social media feeds and you are not realizing the value of time then you may suffer from sleep deprivation it may lead to lack of sleep and other further physical issues physical health problems then it could decrease your productivity decrease your focus span focus attention time or probably you may uh, just want to quick solutions to problems however big they are so these are some of the issues that we have been saying and apart from then let's discuss what can we do to probably address all of these there are positive aspects now we just saw some of the negative aspects to it but how can we address that they remain in balance and we can take advantage of the uh, the connectivity that the social media provides so first of all governance and regulation this will be on multiple levels not just the government regulation yes that comes through various laws and legislation such as it law 2000 then there are it rules recently amended and regulation also these regulation has to be from the side of social aspect also from the level at the level of family at the level of parents at the level of school iec activities through education through school classes so it has to be multifarious then a dedicated social media policy and it has to be disseminated in different corners so that people are aware that first of all there is a media called social media and that exists what are its positives what are its negatives how to use it to your benefit and how to cope uh, out of the negative consequences if someone is suffering through it then we have to ensure that there are safeguards for inappropriate content especially considering these youth uh, population so first of all we can take to age appropriate content this should be done 
first of all at the regulatory level then also parental controls must be ensured we will take this discussion and the point on parental control later on first of all uh, but before that we should be discussing digital literacy so we see that there is a problem of digital literacy some of our population is still out uh, of that uh, umbrella and is not digitally connected so first of all we have to ensure that they are digitally co uh, connected and they have a solution and they could uh, connect to these social media platforms to take advantage secondly at the same time we have to ensure that they are aware because like i said if they are not aware they could use social media to their disadvantage and then they may probably not realize that it's a technology it's a two wedged technology then role of social media platform not just the government or our uh, parents at our home and the society but also these platforms has to be uh, has to be hold they have to be held accountable in the form of that they are the fiduciary they have the fiduciary responsibility they are the intermediaries they should be given responsibilities like that so yes they they have been uh, some provisions which have been added to these it rules to ensure that these platforms remain neutral and they should also invest into the infrastructure which helps to uh, cope with the issues that youth suffers after probably uh, using these platforms and also they should take prevention so that these age appropriate content is only given and uh, these youth especially the young children can take access to then again as like i've said social institutions like parents family educational institutions and the society this could also be considered so first of all i've already said that parents can take to parental controls they can supervise what kind of screen time is given to their children especially in their young age once they become adult they are informed that is they at least are presumed and given access to all kinds of information they can make their informed decision but once until this any children any child is in its youth and initial years it is important to have a over, over, oversight then there could be educational institutions also in educational institutions there could be guidelines there could be chapters there could be conferences work discussions and of course overall society the society should take an active call and proactive call to ensure that these kind of norms are executed and implemented then the role of transparency these social media uh, houses and the platforms have to come transparent have to ensure that they do not uh, utilize and take to fully commercial models where they are just using youth people as consumers they have to be conscious of the norms that the country uh, probably put on it or they have to be ethical also so they have to ensure ethical guidelines are taken when uh, they probably utilize all of these logarithms and design their um, courses and design their content then the last point how can we improve probably and balance the social media usage is support for mental health is for those people who are already suffering through uh, through depression anxiety and such kind of behaviors by the usage of social media so for that that there could be support for mental health right from these platforms as well as from the government side so this was overall an idea of social media and why the countries like spain are considering to put uh probably uh, a comma or probably to limit the usage of social media by the youth why it is important so this was regarding this topic now i would like to uh, give you certain tips on maintaining your mental well being while using social media we can you also use them as way forward or giving the particular suggestions in this topic so limit sessions to a few minute you have to ensure that the conversation and the things that you are involving in they are they remain productive they remain useful to you and you are not wasting your precious time lot of time in all of these things especially avoid toxic content uh, anyway the content anything that is not suiting or probably wasting your time is toxic in nature toxic is nothing that actually wastes your time and do not make sense is not logical and rational is toxic if you are again expecting something unrealistic that is again toxic not just to you but towards the towards the people that surrounds you so you have to ensure that this toxicity remains not just towards other but you also 
look inwards and try to see what are the usual and the basic causes that is leading or your thinking towards uh, thinking in those terms. Then trim contacts. You do not necessarily need to increase the number of content, uh, contacts. You have to, you need to unfollow and probably not following things that are not helping you uh, in the constructive thinking. Maybe some pages or some uh, information could be biased. There is a lot of misinformation and disinformation that is existing on social media. And there are many uh, partners to it. So nobody is to be particularly blamed, but you have to take a conscious decision on your part to just not following all of those accounts, pages, contacts, anything that could be. You have to remain active. You can all uh, only use these social media platforms to your benefit if you are a proactive learner, if you are uh, already aware what to see and what not to see, where you have the right and have the freedom and of course free mind to think that yes, you have a choice and you can take your decision. You should be probably using these kind of social media to uh, enhance your creativity, to learn some skills that helps you. Or that could be anything that interests you and that benefits you. So there is a lot of, uh, there are many uh, avenues where you can take. There is no dearth of such avenues where you can positively use social media platforms. But yes, you have to stay away from the tendencies to get negatively motivated towards negative content. Then you have to prioritize people. Social media is there, but the purpose and the goal is to maintain healthy contacts. At the same time, when you're getting people in face-to-face uh, -face conversations, I think the purpose is already served and the means of uh, social media is not required anymore. So prefer outdoor activities, prefer face-to-face -face social maintaining social relations. So I'm not saying to uh, just avoid and not taking to social media, but remain and keep the goal in mind and probably engage it, uh, positive, engage with it positively and on the positive note. Take breaks, uh, do not continuously keep on browsing these platforms. That could be any platform that you may be using. It could also be news platform because there are innumerable number of these platforms. Uh, news coming from 24 seven, these news platforms and their pages, they are constantly updating news. I mean, how possibly uh, every minute, how can you change the news? At the end of the make some short intervals, some short time where you will be referring to these news and not like every other hour because that is going to waste a lot of your time. So then, like I've said, don't replace real life, take to real life activities, real connections, meet real people, make real connections. And beware of addiction. We have been talking about this addiction, uh, addiction and its uh, negative impact, especially on youth. So yes, I would like to re-emphasize and reiterate, please beware of that addiction. Make sure that you are not falling in that category. And if you are, please take all those helps that are available. So this was regarding this topic. Now the question of the day, try to write it. What is the impact of social media usage on young minds? Examine the steps that governments are taking to address the issues with social media's impact on young users. So this was our topic one of the day. Now moving on to second topic, which is about, in, uh, which is basically concerns to international relations, especially India and its neighborhood. So the topic is India-Bhutan relations. The context is recently Bhutan King visited India and that highlights the strong diplomatic relations, historical culture and the uh, historical cooperation that these countries have seen, Bhutan and India. So let's understand more on this aspect. First of all, significance of Bhutan to India. So we will see significance how Bhutan is important to India. Secondly, how India is crucial to Bhutan. So first of all, starting with this, First of all, if you see the location of Bhutan, there you can see China and here it is India. And there is this Siliguri corridor. This corridor connects, why is it a geopolitical or geostrategic location? Because this is entire North India that India has. This gets connected to this part of India via this channel or via this route known as Siliguri corridor or chicken snack neck so Bhutan provides a buffer zone because you know there are no uh, formal borders as such so it provides a buffer zone wherein this provides more route to pass the or, or provide space to connect northern states with India 
So it has a crucial importance. There are many passes also. On, on the left side, on the northernmost boundary of Bhutan is the location of China. And in the southern and on the east and west corners, it is surrounded by India. So it has its strategic importance. It also uh, goes by go, going back to various decades, India has ensured and has had a flourished relationship with Bhutan in terms of culture, be it religion, Buddhism, uh, the angle of languages, culture, various traditions that Bhutan's traditions actually take a, a lot of common, uh, commonality with India's. Then there is also a huge dimension of this relationship is related to hydropower cooperation. So far, India has helped Bhupal building four hydropower projects. And among them, recently, you saw that India allowed uh, Bhutan selling power to India, especially one of these hydropower plants. This, is, this remains the highlight of the relation. Apart from an Indian diaspora, Bhutan also has a lot of uh, Indian diaspora. If we can spell, it has more than 50,000 Indians living there and probably making their livelihoods. Similarly, they also share because they find commonality between uh, both of these countries. They stay there, earn their living, probably go for tourism also. So all of these reasons are involved. I'm sorry. Uh, then the point of biodiversity conservation. So if you have known that Bhutan is the first carbon neutral country in the world. And if you are aware, there was a concept of gross national happiness. And this concept has been taken and uh, adopted by Bhupa, uh, Bhutan over the concept of gross domestic product, <clears throat> GDP. So GNP instead of GDP. So all of these uh, efforts and initiatives taken by the Bhutan reflects its sentiments towards the biodiversity conservation environmental consciousness. So that's why on that aspect also there is a flourished relationship between both of these countries. Now let's see, having seen the significance of Bhutan to India, now let's see how India is significant to Bhutan. So first of all, economic support. If we talk about trade-wise in, in uh, terms of trade, then Bhutan almost conducts it 80% of its trade with India only. To give you some stats, it's around 483 billion US dollars. That was in around 2014 and 15. It has gone down, it has gone uh, up and it has increased to three times almost, going over 1500 US million dollars in 2022 and 23. So this represents the speed that we are gaining and we are conducting ourselves from the economic sphere. There is also the third aspect to it, which is about the FDI. So if you see India again stands and almost compose, uh, composes 50% of the FDI share, the investment that Bhutan gets from India, it's almost Bhutan's share of 50% uh, of Bhutan's overall FDI capacity. So almost 50%. Then the case and the point of security. Security wise also, uh, India is majorly responsible and takes its uh, responsibility towards the security of uh, Bhutan. Recently we saw Doklam crisis, where China tried to make attempts on the territory of Bhutan. On that, India took its stand and tried to preserve the sovereignty and sanctity of territory of Bhutan. Then third point is diplomatic support. Again, diplomatically also, India is the one that has been supporting for centuries Bhutan on international fronts, on uh, international agreements, convention, resolution. Bhutan has always found India as its friend. Then social, uh, about socio-economic development, India has helped Bhutan in multiple ways. It has provided five year, uh, during 2018, India provided 5,000 crore budget support, budgetary support. And it also, see the like various human assistance and development assistance has been given from time to time to Bhutan by India. Then if we talk about the space cooperation, then you will see 
that space wise recently india and bhutan launched first of their satellites and it this saw the first of the very initial uh, steps towards the cooperation that could also take place in the arena of space apart from defense then fintech cooperation there uh, there have been multiple efforts and initiatives such as upi app and rupee credit rupee card was launched in around 2019 and 20 then we saw again the passing and the acceptance of bheem app this again took place in around 2021 so this cooperation is going on and this is not uh, the comprehensive coverage but to give you an idea of the multiple aspects this is the overall significance of india to bhutan please pay attention to the location of bhutan you can see that its capital is thimphu and it is located here doklam plateau you can see here the location is here and now we can see but still we see that there are hiccups in this relationship there are various hurdles so we need to straighten them out but first of all we have to recognize what are those specific challenges first of all there are there is a boundary dispute with china uh, like the case of doklam we saw uh, recently few years or probably few months back there was a claim so after that we saw that china overall has border with 14 countries and it has so far solved its boundary disputes with 12 of them now the two remaining are india and the other is bhutan with bhutan again it has tried to resolve this dispute and for, uh, formed a mechanism that uh, dispute is still to be resolved but at least they have formed a mechanism and india is the last one probably they have been trying their efforts from both sides we have been seeing these initiatives and efforts second is uh, the challenge of geopolitical implications for india like i said this siliguri corridor is geopolitically very important for india its sovereignty its territorial integrity it's very important to safeguard that passage uh, to have a cooperation with bhutan which is a buffer zone and to not to let other elements get into this pore including china then there are concerns over hydropower project the implementation has been slow even after four uh, hydropower projects that india has set up in bhutan there are other uh, initiatives and accords also but they are slow in implementation and execution again some uh, quarters from bhutan bhutan has been claiming that these agreements are more or less in favor of india so yes there need to uh, we need to sit out the both parties have to sit down and renegotiate these agreements so that there remains a win win situation for both then the bbin initiative what is the bbin initiative it is bhutan bangladesh india and nepal initiative this initiative was signed and uh, this is a connectivity agreement between these countries so that they can uh, have an access to bay of bengal and probably to the seas Uh, but we saw in the past that bhutan chose to uh, take out or probably opt out of this agreement due to its own environmental concerns but uh, these other countries have gone ahead and signed this agreement so these are more or less or broadly the challenges that these countries are facing now to take uh, this was also just to give you an idea this was sakteng wildlife sanctuary there were also uh, efforts on the china side to probably disagree with the territory of tan on this sakteng wildlife sanctuary which lies on the border of arunachal pradesh and presently in bhutan so this gives an idea what is happening and what are the challenges that majorly uh, you find a place in india bhutan relations now what can be done and what can we do what steps can be taken so that to improve and further safeguard this relationship first of all we have to address economic concerns the what it has to be multifarious Uh, right from fdi to trade to goods and services that we are trading and transporting we have to ensure connectivity as well so as to reduce the freight charges again increasing connectivity to bay of bengal via other agreements probably trying uh, to convince bhutan to take to bbi an initiative then adapting to global changes there are many changes that bhutan is probably uh, a bit comprehensible about apprehensible uh, apprehensible about 
that we have to sit down and have a greater discussion on all of these changes and global changes like uh, climate change, probably more economic and digital transformation, urban development, many technologies and the funds that is the need of the Bhutan could be solved if we sit down and solve on the, all of these topics. Then the case of promoting tourism. Bhutan is known for its ecological tourism, its ecological gain and ecological <clears throat> forest and uh, the biodiversity that it has. India, similarly, India has its own advantages. There could be exchanges between these countries and they could promote and value each other tourism. Some case studies could be cross-exchanged, which has worked for one country and could equally be uh, well suited to another country. Then multilateral platforms. We have already seen the cooperation on platforms such as SARC, then another BIMSTEC platform, where India and Bhutan both are uh, members. Then platforms such as SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Then another could be BRICS, where we should be actively engaging in conversations and in dialogues to ensure that these platforms are rightfully utilized to improve India and neighborhood relations, including Bhutan. Then resolution of boundary issues. This has to be done on urgent basis. Like I said, India remains, uh, in, when it comes to India and China also, that dispute resolution on borders, especially still unsolved, that needs to sit down. Partners like Bhutan also needs to be involved to have a comprehensive discussion, especially in areas where these three are the common parties. Then enhancing defense cooperation. We may take to more joint uh, military or probably defense exercises and pro could provide training sessions to uh, probably uh, the forces of Bhutan as well. Then improving connectivity. This we have to ensure uh, through rail and road networks. So both of these uh, means have to be explored and developed more. So as there's this free exchange of people, goods, ideas, and uh, also the e-connectivity as well. Then environmental concerns. Some concerns Bhutan has with respect to climate change and the increasing pollution or probably changing demography and the increasing population, those all could be settled down if we discuss them in comprehensive sense. So these are certain steps that we can employ to improve this relationship and address all the obstacles that this relationship faces. So now the question, India-Bhutan relationship demonstrates India's commitment to its neighborhood policy, discuss various key ideas or areas of collaboration and the challenges between India and Bhutan. So please try to answer this question. Now moving to the simplified sections of the day, first of the articles deal with Bharatiya Vayuyan Vidhyayak. So what is this act and what does it replace? So there was this Aircraft Act 1934, uh, going back to 1934, that old, still it has faced so many amendments so far. So the final and the actual act has come down now by including all the changes that we are facing today with respect to airlines and airport sector. So that is the context of this act. Let's see what is this act and how does and why do we need to change it now. So the initial act was Aircraft Act of 1934. It has become archaic. It has suited the situations and the conditions prevailing back then. Uh, that was the British era. So of course, it has to be tuned and to be updated with the present times and the needs. Second, we have already tried almost 21 times so far to amend it, to bring in changes, but it is still not up to the date. So it has to be comprehensive regulation dealing with every aspect of the aviation sector. Then the main purpose is to ensure ease of doing business. That will in, uh, enable the sector to increase and move on to the trajectory to make greater advances and become one of the competitive sectors in the world. Then, like I said, it has to cater different dimensions in this sector, right from repair, maintenance, and probably regulation, uh, designing, making aircrafts. So all of these dimensions has to be dealt in with a single act so that there, there is of ease of doing business. Now let's tell you some of the features and key aspects of this Bhartiya Vayuyan Vidhyayak. 
So key features is that the goal is to align with international standards because if uh, Indian aviation sector and the airlines has to compete in the world market or the, at the world stage, it has to be uh, aligned with certain common criteria and standards. And these standards are taken from nothing else but Chicago Convention. What is Chicago Convention? It has been adopted by ICAO, International Civil Aviation Organization, to set standards for airline sector worldwide. So that is why first of the goal remains that, apart from it, it uh, we see that aviation market is growing. Uh, if we, uh, just to give you a certain idea, this overall aviation sector in India contributes around 5% of GDP to India, 5% uh, of India's GDP. And it also provides around 4 million jobs. So it is one of the important employment sector. Now to give the status of this uh, Indian domestic sector, it stands third at the world stage. If we compare the airline domestic market, and it is said to become the third largest passenger market, uh, overtaking UK at the end of 2024, which we are approaching. So that is the growing aviation market, the potential of this market. But before that, before we can uh, reach that goal, we have to ensure that these all these regulations are aligned, are set straight, so as to not uh, be uh, not so that waste of resources and time could be reduced. Then it encourages domestic manufacturing and aircraft design. Why this is important? Not just to indigenize the technology, but also the production of these flights, airplanes, uh, in the within the country. That involves that is a, one of the big uh, economic sectors that earns revenue in in uh, probably billions, and it has a billion dollar market. That's why it's important that we also imply the aspect of and the uh, the en element of make in India policy and includes all those provisions of make in India and enable this sector also so that these production and manufacturing could take place within the borders. Then also we need to ensure that not just producing and manufacturing but also the post manufacturing activities such as maintenance, repair, overhaul, overall known as by the name of MRO sector, this ecosystem could be established and these activities could take place within India because India lo uh, lo uh, loses crucial uh, mark, uh, crucial markets, market and revenue when it takes to MRO activity and probably outsource these activities to other countries. Then now there is a need to make one authority responsible and to take crucial steps. So central government has been given this responsibility under this act and for public safety for probably there might be cases of where there is a need to detain some of the airlines for various purposes. So then central government remains the nodal authority and institution to do that. Then modern aviation technology we are seeing in the present uh, arena and present uh, system like technology like drones, unmanned air vehicles, then flying taxis, all of these have been coming up. We have been seeing working on the technology, research and development have been going on, but we have not kept with the required regulation and norms that are necessary to make these technologies work on ground. So to bring in that aspect also, this Bharti Vayu and Vidyak has been brought on. Then there are authorities such as Directorate General of Civil Aviation, Bureau of Civil Aviation Security, and Aircraft Accident Investigation Bureau. These are crucial authorities that have been given the clear-cut mandate and clear-cut authorities and responsibilities so that there is no mismatch and there is no blame game and there is no wastage of time in taking crucial decisions. So these are overall broad features of this act. The purpose is to ensure ease of doing business. Now let's tell you something and the important pointers on Director General of Civil Aviation. It is the regulatory body in the field of civil aviation. Primarily civil aviation has a lot of segments but the safety, safety concern and the safety issues is catered by this regulatory body known by the name of Director General of Civil Aviation. Then it is an attached office. It works under the Ministry of Civil Aviation. It also ensures regulation of airport transport services, air transport services, and also enforcement and execution of various civil air regulation, air safety standards, and airworthiness standards. 
so again regulates also certain activities that it takes into the enforcement aspect then it coordinates also various regulatory factions because somebody has to regulate if there are multiple uh, f um, authorities taking care of reg different regulatory function which is also necessary because they all need expertise but there has to be coordinating authority also that is so it uh, coordinates with all of them it also coordinates with the international civil aviation organization which i already mentioned in the beginning part icao and its headquarters is located where it is located in new delhi director general of civil aviation now something about airports authority of india so it is a statutory body as you know statutory body is what that is uh, gets its formation or establishment by an act of parliament so it is a civil aviation authority it is not the new it is in fact it came to being in 1995 but it existed before that in the form of two authorities national airports authority and international airports authority of india these two organizations were merged in 1995 and uh, arose then then arose airports authority of india aai so these are some of the details uh, that is going to help you in your upcoming prelims apart from it now let's move on to our second topic in the simplified section which is about the price rise that we are witnessing in odisha in case of potato now let's see what are the crucial reason or what are the specific reason that is leading to such a price rise and is this case specific with odisha or what are the uh, specific reasons behind uh, that, uh, that this has led to this situation and has it been the overall year situation or is it just the case of temporary it's or is it just a temporary case so let's look into all of these factors first of all what are the reasons that uh, or probably what this article highlights is that there has been a restricted supply from bengal why bengal you may ask so first of all you have to understand uh, there are few major producers of potato in india up is the first largest producer second is west bengal that's why uh, the bengal the importance of west bengal in this case and when it comes to odisha west bengal uh, has limited its supply Uh, to odisha and odisha being one of the major consumer it does not produce uh, much of these potatoes why because it has agro climatic conditions which are not suitable for the growth of this crop which is a temperate crop or to be specific temperate climate crop potato and it needs around 15 to 25 degree celsius to be grown but that is not the environmental condition in odisha that's why it's dependent on its imports from other states like up and west bengal this time it is facing supply crunch because the supply has it has not received from bengal so this is the initial part now like i've said if you compare it on the world stage india is the second largest producer of potato after china and potato production wise uh, if we compare and if we uh, let's say uh, we do not have to assume that potato production has decreased no that is not the case in fact potato production the productivity and the production area these three things have increased over the years from 1991 to 2021 over the span of around 20 years we have seen the production area has gone from 11 to 22 lakh hectares this is the uh, statistics with respect to india so the area has increased production has increased productivity as well has increased now out of this like i said up is the major producer in india it accounts for around 161 out of the total 533 lakh metric tons of production of potato in 2021 and 22 this gives you an idea of what proportion uh, the producer up is with respect to onion production and like i said odisha is a major consumer now having understood this uh, context we need to read some of these slides here which has been highlighted in this article so generally potatoes is a rabi crop it's some part of also takes place in kharif but majorly it is a rabi crop and it comes from states such as up bihar gujarat madhya pradesh assam punjab haryana jharkhand and chatisgarh in kharif also there is some uh, sort of or some share of potato comes from states such as himachal pradesh uttarakhand also from karnataka so like i said remember that this is a rabi crop and the supply comes in during winter and spring seasons now this time what happened is this was when the new rabi crops arrives in winter their prices were low 
and spring season. So like I said, Rabi crops arrival, the crop comes into the market during winter and spring season. And you would see that there is a lower prices because more supply during Rabi, if, if any crop is Rabi, its supply will be in winter and spring season. And if supply is more, prices will be lower. So that's why prices generally remain slower during these seasons. And when there is a lean season, lean season means Kharif uh, seasons or the third uh, season, when you would see rise in prices because then supply is less. So there is an inverse relation between supply and prices. Having said that, the prices have remained elevated not only in Odisha. So it's not a Odisha specific case. This has been the case across India in almost all the states. So it has, uh, it has nothing to do. Uh, even West Bengal must have seen reduced production. So now to tell you more on the reasons why Odisha is facing so first of all, we have understood the context. Now, why uh, in certain seasons we have uh, lean supply and when we have we have more supply. Now, see the specific reasons in Odisha's case. There was a drop in potato production 2023 and 24. It went down to 567 met uh, lakh metric tons from 601 lakh metric tons uh, in 2022 and uh, 24. Now we saw in 2022 and 2023, prices of potato remained low. Now what happens is when prices of potato are low, it's a, it is good from the consumer side, it is good from the market side, but it is not good for the producer. It is not good for the farmers who are producing those potatoes because they'll get low prices. They may not feel incentivized enough. They may It may affect their livelihood also. So they may not feel um, uh, incentivized to grow that crop on the same amount of or probably uh, same quantity of land that reduces the growing area. That is the one of the reason there were low prices last year, uh, the year 2022-23 and that led to reduced growing area also. So the growth area and the production area that got uh, reduced and that led to UP production and West Bengal, the two major producers in India, they both they, they saw their production reducing. Uh, UP particularly saw 10 lakh metric tons reduction while West Bengal see the 15 lakh metric reduction. That's why there is less of supply coming from Bengal to Odisha. So this is, this is what uh, this article also highlights. Here you can read. Now, so this was around this topic why we have seen the rise of uh, price rise in case of potato in Odisha. Now the case and the article that talks about a three nation visit as a foray into submit diplomacy. So we have to understand first of all, what is submit diplomacy? What is a three nation visit? And what is the context? So uh, all of you must have noticed recently Prime Minister Modi visited all of these three countries, including uh, Brazil, Guyana and Nigeria. So this, this was a three country visit. That's why this article mentions three nation, uh, nation visit as a foreign to submit diplomacy because he primarily uh, meant to go to G20 that was taking place in Rio de Janeiro, uh, de Janeiro in Brazil. But along with it, he also visited two nations and not just as a pit stop, but a proper uh, involving bilateral, regional and global conversations and dialogues. So this was a three nation visit. This was an experiment in case of foreign policy that India is experimenting with and it has worked out very well. So let's know what are the crucial pointers with respect to this topic. So first of all, like I said, it was a three nation visit. Uh, it involved three nations, Nigeria, Brazil, Guyana from, and it was a transcontinental visit involving three different geographies, right from Latin America, that is South America, Africa, as well as Caribbean country. So Guyana was a Caribbean country, Brazil in case of Latin America, that is South America, and also Nigeria from Africa. It had multiple objectives, right from attending the G20 summit in Brazil, and also discussing the bilateral relations. Uh, Prime Minister Modi also took all of these conversations from different perspective and different fields in Nigeria, as well as Guyana. Then again, we have seen that foreign policy priorities, uh, priorities have been changing and they have been experimenting and th this diplomacy have been proactive for last few years and it has seen its results also. So uh, like I've said, the first leg was in Nigeria, for Prime Minister's stop in Nigeria and crucial developments took place. First of all was it was 
not to be taken as a pit stop but a full scale state visit so why the importance of nigeria because it is africa's fourth uh, most populous country and it is the fourth largest economy in africa itself so it has a huge geopolitical and economic relevance and if we talk about the platform and the increasing stature of nigeria last year india invited nigeria to be a part of g20 summit in india again it is also uh, asked to be a member of brics last year by india and mm. this year we have seen the chairmanship or chair uh, of economic community of west africa that is ecowas states going to nigeria that's telling a lot about the importance and stature of nigeria as a whole in african countries then these both countries india as well as nigeria they are natural partners how first of all they are two large democracies they are multi religious multilingual multi ethnic societies they both depend and rely on and probably believe in uni uh, unity and diversity they again uh, believe and probably have commented on fighting the joint combat against terrorism separatism and extremism so there are many commonalities commonalities between these countries then there are new areas have also been discovered in the increasing and the changing space dynamics such as agriculture new technologies in agriculture urban development transportation increasing connectivity the case of renewable energy uh, increasing the use of wind energy solar energy and also digital transformation uh, in recent in, uh, years india has seen many initiatives in this arena and india needs to and india intends to share such successful case studies with other countries especially global south countries uh, with its expertise and in this case we saw when uh, prime minister modi went to nigeria he signed three mous in this case now secondly he stopped at g20 and he attended the g uh, he stopped at uh, in in brazil and attended the g20 summit wherein it was a 19th summit it took place at, at rio de janeiro and it involved 19 countries apart from two regional organizations so you have to know certain basics about g20 the recent summit that took place in brazil and it involved three three key priorities or three key themes which was social inclusion second was sustainable development and reform of global governance institution so these were key three themes in case of first of all social inclusion this summit ended up by signing an agreement on global alliance against hunger and poverty in the case of sustainable development this organization and the g20 summit reiterated its efforts the uh, the same efforts that it highlighted during g20 summit that took place in india last year in case of global governance institutions it again laid down the road map for better bigger and more effective multilateral development banks so the case of multilateral development banks was put forward this happened with respect to these three key themes we saw india also taking active and proactive dialogues and conversations with united states europe and many countries from global south even external affairs ministers s jashankar uh, took active uh, involvement and dialogues with its counterpart regarding various concerns and issues now the third leg of this visit was which was wrapped up in guyana of course in one caribbean country it has 1 million people out of which 40% is of uh, 40% is indian origin it has huge lot of energy reserves which is crucial given the energy demands of india and many different sectors were catered to there were 10 amus uh, mous which were signed which related to right from energy defense urban development transportation digital collaboration food security education this is just to give you some idea how this three nation summit took place you don't really have to memorize this then seven pillars were also discussed to deepen cooperation all of these fields were there you can read it uh, for yourself just to highlight it it also highlighted cricket and the culture it also highlighted ocean economy medicine and health just have an idea and have a look at it overall this three nation summit contributed to india's enhanced global standing guyana's president himself claimed prime minister modi as a champion among leaders that highlighted india's increased and enhanced position at the global stage 
Now, it is expected that the New Delhi and the overall government of India could optimize the outcome of this bold initiative and effort or so to say essay in diplomatic arena. So this was about this summit and some details about three nation summit. Moving on to the next article, government proposes GST like panel body to push agree reforms in states. So why GST panel like body? Because it is one dedicated uh, institution to be working towards one common cause that needs coordination and cooperation of various states. That's why one central authority was needed, including the part uh, partnership and participation of all of these states. That's why this body was made. Now, similar, now there is there has been a committee which has recommended to form a similar institutional mechanism so that agriculture reforms, particularly in the field of uh, marketing, could take place because we have been trying to bring in all of these reforms especially related to marketing in agriculture sector for various years. But we have only seen the limited success. That's why a similar recommendation. Now let's read more about this. So committee, this committee uh, which has recommended the formation of similar uh, mechanism was formed by a uh, minister of agriculture and farmers welfare. And it has recommended to form a similar mechanism on the lines of empowered committee of state finance minister on GST. Like I said, there is a mechanism which is an empowered finance ministers on GST in every state. From uh, th In this committee, every state finance minister participates and discusses issues, whatever uh, is of relevance to that particular state. Now, if we want to convey and bring in reforms and consensus in the field of agriculture marketing, we also need a similar mechanism. So this is the gist. Now, uh, I've already said that product progress so far, uh, it's not like that we have not taken various initiatives. We have tried to making such an uh, efforts. For example, we have also formulated model APMC Act. And this has uh, guided various states to form their own APMC Act. But like because of the lack of sen uh, consensus, because of the lack of uniformity, it has not resulted in creating the all India market at the ground stage. So first of all, to tell you more on this, we need to know what is NAM. This is a national agriculture market. It was announced, uh, announced in budget 2014 and 15. The purpose was to create an electronic trading portal. So in, in the immediate aspect, we created this e-market so that this uh, give and take of agriculture products and selling and buying of these products could take place across the country and it could establish a unified national market but it only happened in e-electronic sense. We, the larger goal was to create it on, on ground, on real field, that could not take place. For that, again, there was model APMC Act 2003. There were certain features to it. The purpose was, and each of these APMC Act, which was formulated by the state, had to be administered by separate agriculture produce market committee and it involves certain features especially features such as there was a single market fee it could not be varied because there was a lot of corruption and alleged mistreatment of all of these parties then there was direct marketing so all of these you can read about this electronic trading contract farming this provision was also there so states as per their capacity for example Punjab has gone ahead and also adopted this provision in its own acts there was a point about price discovery, market di diversification, freedom to the farmer to sell its products and reduced intermediaries because this was leading to loss of revenue, not just to the farmers, but also to the government and the state exchequer. So this was more or less model APMC Act, which was formulated by the central government and it was supposed to be adopted by the states as per their required modifications. But like I said, it saw limited success. That's why now uh, there is a recommendation to form a similar mechanism on the lines of uh, finance ministers of model GST uh, or the GST to adopt. <clears throat> okay, so this have, we have already read. The committee may be chaired and the committee that this uh, th that has been recommended to be formulated, it has also been provided that any state minister from these different states, agriculture state minister could be could chair this committee on rotational basis because there are many states now. How would you decide who would be the chairman or who would head this committee? So it could be done on rotational basis or it could be done on regional basis. There could be made certain regions and one state could represent that uh, region and could become the or probably hold the chair. So these are some of the suggestions. 
uh, first of all, uh, before that, you also need to know about agriculture marketing. What is agriculture? So we all know what is agriculture. There is one element of agriculture markets in its various uh, backward and forward, especially in forward chain. It involves the uh, carry carrying of goods and products from the point of production, that is the fields and the farmlands, to the point of consumption, at the end to the consumer. It involves not just one process, but right from planning, production, transportation, also processing and distribution of agriculture goods. So it's a supply chain involving various uh, components. Please remember, these are key components of this agriculture marketing chain. Products reach consumers, why it is done? So that they reach consumers efficiently and both parties remains in a win-win situation. Farmers accept and receive adequate prices for their crops. Consumers get them at affordable prices. Food security is also maintained, um, uh, ensured, and the government gets the revenue. And market demands are satisfied at a fair price. Then agriculture marketing overall comes under the entry 28 of state list. So it is a state subject under article 246. And especially remember, it comes under the seventh schedule of the constitution. Now to give you an idea, Government has also taken many other steps to ensure that this marketing chain and the agriculture marketing gets strengthened. So there was one lakh crore agriculture infrastructure fund which was established by the government of India to ensure that farm gate infrastructure, whatever infrastructure in different segments are needed to be developed that gets developed at the farm gate itself. So that was the one. Second is to benefit primary agriculture cooperative society, there were uh, for, uh, constitution or formation of farmer producer organization. This ensured economies of scale, this ensured less wastage and probably bargaining power. So they were established. Then there was also uh, provision of cold chain and post harvest management infrastructure. Why? So that there is reduced wastage. If we go by the records, we saw we see every year around 6,000 crore of post-harvest waste going into the drain every year at India's scale. This needs to be reduced and so that's why there was a recommendation to build and strengthen this supply chain. Also affordable and financially able viable infrastructure for post-harvest management, not just the wastage but probably also to keep them increase their shelf life, to be taken it uh, to the consumers, branding them. Uh, processing them and everything. So ev every aspect of this supply chain structure post harvest management was tried or probably was catered to from the side of the government. Now the last article of the day which reads ISRO's PSLV places two satellites of European Space Agency into orbit. Few days back there was a discussion on the Proba 3 mission which is a mission of European Space Agency. We have discussed in previous analyst sections you can see it for the details. Right now, the context is that this ISRO's PSLV has already launched this, the, this uh, mission and uh, launched these satellites. And this shows and reflects on the cooperation between European Space Agency and ISRO. So to know or tell you more in the specifics that we have not covered so far is, first of all, that it has been launched from the country's only spaceport in Andhra Pradesh, Sri Harikota. So what is a spaceport? It is nothing but a cosmodrome or a spaceport, just like any seaport, what's, what a seaport does for ships, what an airport does for an aircraft. Similarly, the spaceport is to do for launching spacecraft. So don't get driven by the language. It's a simple spaceport, which has uh, which is located in the Andhra Pradesh, Sri Harikota. Now you have to tell me in the comment section, recently Prime Minister launched the second spaceport in India. Where is that located? Uh, now coming back to this article, this was coordinated by the uh, ISRO specific branch, which is known by the name of New Space India Limited. And this was the first time India workhorse rocket attempted a launch at such a highly elliptical orbit at a uh, altitude of around 60,000 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So two, two critical points. First of all, that it was a highly elliptical orbit. Secondly, it was highest point over 60,000 kilometers from the surface of the earth. 
the two satellites along this uh, formation flying what is formation flying these two satellites they were stacked on top of each other they maintained parallel orbits and they uh, on took to the formation flying to give you the meaning of this term formation flying you must have seen multiple uh, of these you know flying objects they when they are coordinated when they are synchronized when they are predetermined to act in a certain way then there is known as formation flying so this phenomena was taking place in this case with respect to two satellites they were stacked on two uh, first of all they were stacked then they were separated and they were going into parallel of uh, orbits this particular stance and phenomena this demonstrated the very first time uh, the formation flying in the world not just in india this was not the first time in india at the global scale this was the first time that formation flying was demonstrated in terms of space for and then uh, another thing to be known about this that this pair of satellite has been designed to study the solar corona this uh, we have already discussed in the case of proba 3 what is its mission what is its goal what are its components uh, you can refer to the previous analysts and this like i said 60000 km away from the surface of earth now you can ask why this specific uh, distance and a measure of 60000 km that is why because at this distance earth's gravitation force or the gravitation energy it is almost minimal and the thrust required to maintain these satellites away from earth gets reduced and thus this leads to reduced consumption of fuel and saving of energy as well as revenue so this position was chosen and with uh, we can maintain these satellites there at that position without using too much fuel so the logic i have meant, uh, already told you the to reduce the thrust it required less thrust to maintain those satellites at that distance and apart from that isro now apart from this mission proba 3 mission and european space agency uh, isro is again planning to launch another pslv mission and that will take place through pslv c60 it is going to launch pedex experiment what is pedex experiment it is nothing it has it involves two spacecraft you can understand by involving two vehicles chaser and the target but the both the chaser and target both are nothing but two spacecraft one could be ahead could uh, known as target and one could be behind that would be known by the name of chaser so they come together and connect in space why do they connect in space to serve multiple purposes or certain functions such as and ensuring critical uh, operations such as assembling it the reason could be maybe we want to or we may, may need to assemble these space stations refueling transferring astronauts or the cargo itself so there could be many multiple purposes we have seen we have been required or we have been needing to ensure such a mechanism so that missions such as gaganyaan also chandrayaan 4 these missions would involve this spadex experiment to be successful because that will involve cross maneuvering or operations between two spacecraft so that is why this is the demonstration of that technique it is going to help in the future operations and future missions it demonstrate precision it involves a great element and degree of navigation and control capabilities this speaks a lot about the research and development capabilities of india in the space sector and again it is the first it is going to be the first time demonstration of india's docking capability india's docking docking is nothing what the spadex does two vehicles wherein two both of them are spacecraft and they are operating with each other doing several operations that is the docking facility so this is going to be demonstrated in the upcoming mission by which two aircrafts are brought near and they will be joined together like i said this will be crucial for chandrayaan mission and your uh, gaganyaan mission also so this was for today that is all i hope this session was fruitful for your preparation and all the best take care